Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Um, this um, recording will later be available with Persian subtitles for uh, comrades in Iran and comrades who can't read or understand English. So um, a number of your articles have already been uh, translated to Persian, but we hope this will address a more up-to-date analysis of the world economy in 2024. So welcome, Michael Roberts. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to presenting some of the arguments about what's happening in the world economy to your uh, viewers uh, in Iran and elsewhere. Um, and I think it's important that we should do that because we're continually seeing uh, increasing difficulties for the world economy as a whole. And we need to analyze what's going on and how that's going to affect not just the major economies of the world, but also Iran. In order to do that, as usual, Michael Roberts likes to present a little slideshow. And so with the, with the help of the hosts here, I'm going to share a few graphs with you so you can follow the arguments that I want to make by looking at the graphs. So let me start off by getting this up. So basically, I'm talking about the world economy in 2024. And um, the first thing to say is that basically the major economies in the world, in particular the G7 capitalist economies, are stagnating and are not growing very much at all. People should be aware of this because there's always the talk in the media that the United States is booming, uh, that... Uh, the G7 is very rich and everything's fine and everything is recovering. Well, that's not really uh, such a rosy picture as it painted by the international media. In the last year, the US was the best performing capitalist economy, but the rest of the so-called G7, that's the top seven economies in the world, were either in recession, that means that their national output was contracting, as in the UK and Germany, or stagnating. In other words, it wasn't growing at all in France, Italy, Japan, and Canada. So just think, last year, basically, there was hardly any growth in these top seven economies, except for the US, which had a bit of growth. And the average real GDP growth for these advanced economies was just 1.3%, down from 1.4% in 2022, so actually a slowdown. Uh, and if we look at growth per GDP, that's per person. Uh, so we're taking out the increase in population, which has an effect on national output. More people means more production. But if you just look at the uh, national output per person, then the recovery is even weaker. And on the graph on the right, you can see that since the beginning uh, of the pandemic in 2020, uh, for the last four years, not excluding uh, 2024, excluding that for the moment, the US economy achieved about just over 1% annual growth rate. So this greatly fast growing US economy was growing just at 1% per person, while the other G7 economies were contracting or stagnating. And you can see in the case of the UK, Canada and Germany, there was actually a fall in the overall growth per person over those four year periods. So there's been no growth per person, in fact, the opposite, for some of these countries over the last uh, four years. So this is really a very difficult situation uh, for the major capitalist economies. And, and I like this graph because what it shows to you is how the trajectory of average growth rates are slowing after each crisis. Take the left-hand side of the graph. This is the United States real GDP growth. So we're setting real GDP that's the national output at 100 in 2007. So you can see that it's it just on 100 at 2007. And the growth rates at that time, the average growth rate would suggest it would have risen by the end of 2011 to about 111 from 100. But in fact, because of the major Great Recession we had in 2008-9, it dropped down here and it hasn't returned to that level. It's remained 10% below the previous trajectory uh, before the Great Recession of 2008-9. And then we come to the pandemic slump of 2020. So US economy grows along here, 
and from 100 in 2007, it reaches just over 120 uh, in 2020. So that's over 13 years, remember. Then there's a huge drop in GDP from the US from the pandemic slump, and there's a recovery from the US, a better recovery than other countries, but still short of the trajectory, even the slower trajectory that we've had since 2008-9. So by the end of last year, it, the US economy was still 2% below the average growth rate would, we should, would have achieved uh, after if it kept the same level of growth rates. And of course, it's way down from the, the pre-Great Recession. So the overall decline in the trend is still 13% below where it would have been if there'd been no crises in 2008 or 2020. When we look at the Eurozone on the other side, it's even worse that there's actually it was a 10% fall uh, during the Great Recession, which has not been restored, and another 4% fall during the pandemic slump. So altogether, the Eurozone economies, as an average, that's the major economies in the center of Europe, are 14% below where they would have been if they'd maintained growth rates uh, prior to the Great Recession of 2008-9. So what that tells you is that the major economies are not growing anywhere near as well as they could do to meet uh, people's needs and uh, improve living standards for the majority of their populations. They are slowing down in situations getting worse. Uh, here's a figure to show what's happening in world trade on the very recent period. You can see that in the recovery after the end of the pandemic slump, there was a growth in world trade of about 6%, which is very important to all the smaller economies around the world, like Iran, like the so-called emerging economies of Asia, Latin America, and Africa. World trade is key uh, in order to provide uh, getting dollars, getting more resources uh, available into the country. And yet you can see from the beginning of 2023, there's actually been a fall in world trade. And that includes all sorts of trade, not only energy, but commodities, uh, manufacturing production, and so on. And it's only just crawled back to a, a flat level in the first quarter of 2024. World trade is stagnating around the world. So there's no escape. If all the world's economies are growing very slowly or even contracting domestically, they cannot find an avenue for escape through world trade. I'm going to do the quick number of figures on Iran, which you might be interested in seeing. This is at a uh, national output per person. In Iran, as probably many of the viewers know, you can see that really since the Great Recession, there's been a total stagnation in national output per person in Iran. So no improvement in overall national output and therefore at least no improvement for the average household in Iran since 2007. That's 16, 17 years now where there's been no improvement in output per person. And if we look at investment, which is key to why in this output is not improving. We've seen a, we saw a big drop during uh, from the period 2018 down to 2020, where the pandemic slump, partly due to investment in energy and other uh, Iranian uh, sectors not expanding. And then we've had total stagnation in investment since 2020 for the last four years. So if you go back to 2014, you can see that the annual investment in, in the Iranian economy by the owners of the Iranian economy, corporations and so on, is now lower than it was in 2014. That's 10 years later. And this is in cash terms. So in real terms, if you put it into dollars, it will be even worse. And of course, as you probably well know, uh, this has led low growth, poor investment, has led to low productivity and a real rise in inflation across uh, the country in Iran. So as we can see, uh, before we get to the pandemic slump, we had inflation rates hitting 40%. Uh, it fell during the slump of the pandemic while people died or got ill under COVID. And it's risen again uh, up to the beginning of 2023 to new heights and only just started to slow a little bit. So we've got an inflation rate on average over 30%, close to 40% a year for the last three or four years. And even before that, it was still in double digits. So this, the Iranian economy is suffering really badly, but it's really an expression of what's happening in the world economy because there's no escape anywhere else for Iran through exports and so on. And behind the decline 
and contraction and slowdown of the world economy is the question of profitability. In my view, as a Marxist economist, the key to investment and growth under a capitalist economy is whether capitalists are making a profit. Is the profitability of their investments improving or declining? And you can see over the long term, and this is very long term, this graph going back to 1869, this is the world figure, you can see that there is a general decline in the profitability of capital globally around uh, in, in all these periods, not a straight down decline. You can see there are periods of recovery uh, in the early 1900s before the First World War. And then you can see a recovery during the Second World War. And what we had after the Second World War was the so-called golden age for the major capitalist economies with the profitability rate relatively high. And then the huge profitability crisis, which took place during the 70s and took the profitability of capital on an average around the world to new lows. And that really hasn't changed what I call the period since even the neoliberal period when you know, supposedly workers had their wages cut, private sector was liberated, the public sector was crushed, all to try and boost uh, profitability. It had a very limited effect on average. And now we're in a period, what I call the long depression, where basically there is no improvement in the overall rate of profit, in fact, a decline. And this, but this is the key factor behind why uh, the major economies are not growing so fast enough, why their investment is low, and why the poor, poorer countries of the world, dependent on these major economies for investment quite often, or uh, being isolated from the major economies, are unable to grow and improve the conditions as well. And because profitability has been falling, what capitalists have done is that they borrow more. Not only the public sector, which is what the media goes on about, how the government's spending too much money and debt's riding too much, but it's the private sector, the capitalist sector, households and corporations, where have borrowed even more in order to maintain their standards of living or to try and uh, sustain uh, profitability. So global debt, uh, all the bits of debt from government, corporations and household is now 336% of world GDP, according to the latest figures. That's a record high. So there's a huge weight of debt sitting upon the world capitalist economy, which they each year have to service as best they can. Uh, and the World Bank estimates that 60% of low income countries like Iran are heavily indebted and face a high risk of debt distress. So it's not just Iran. There are myriads of countries around the world now, including middle income countries that cannot afford even to meet uh, the debt burden that they've built up by borrowing money from the private sector and from the IMF, World Bank and other multilateral agencies over the last 20 or 30 years. And debt burdens are really crushing many developing countries. Debt service has been generally low uh, until uh, the recent inflationary spiral because interest rates were low. But that's now dramatically changing. So, for example, debt service now on public debt relative to government revenues has surged from nearly 6% to 16% in the last 10 years or so. So if more money is having to be uh, raised from taxes or borrowed it, by governments in order, is being spent on trying to service the existing debt, that means they have less money to spend on public services, on providing investment in key industries and so on, and to get the economy go, going. So global debt is rising, and in particular, the debt burden for the poorer countries is strangling those economies and their ability uh, to recover from previous crises or to grow at all. Now, looking ahead, what's going to happen for the rest of the decade? Well, I, you don't need a Marxist economist to tell you this. This is the view of the IMF. Uh, the headers of the IMF recently published a paper in which they said, yes, 2020 so far has been a sluggish and disappointing decade. Without course correction, we are heading for a tepid 20s, to use their phrase. Global growth will slow to just 3% by the end of the decade. So you can see on the graph at the moment, global growth projections on a five year ahead have been gradually reduced by uh, the IMF. And they reckon that global growth will only be at 3%. Actually, at the moment, it's around 3%. So we're already at these low levels. And this threatens to reverse the improvements to living standards, such as they are, 
and the unevenness of the slowdown between richer and poorer nations could limit the prospects for global income convergence. That's a gobbledygook way of saying that the poor countries are getting worse and the rich countries will stay rich, uh, even if they're slowed down, and the gap between the poor and the rich will get worse, not better, uh, over the next rest of this decade. And the World Bank goes even worse. They say that they reckon that the global on economy this decade is on for the worst half decade of growth in 30 years. Global trade growth will expect it to be half the average in the decade before, which we've already seen in the previous graph. And the World Bank reckons that Asia, which is the fastest growing emerging sector of the world economy, will have the worst economic outlook in half a century. So the Asian tigers of Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong are set to expand at one of the lowest rates in five decades. That's a th the outlook for the Asian economies, not the Japan, but the advanced Asia, the less advanced Asian economies is the worst in 30 years, says the World Bank. So you can imagine what the position is for Africa, for the Middle East, for Latin America and so on, if Asia is, has that outlook as well. And what we've noticed, I think, in the uh, 21st century is a complete change in the driving forces of growth in the world economy. It used to be the case that global trade was growing much faster than GDP in most countries so that people could export more. There's what we call globalization. There was an expansion of trade uh, with barriers being reduced on tariffs and on uh, quotas and emerging economies and others had to open up their borders to the influx of Western capital and Western uh, products. And in return, uh, they would send commodities back into the West um, whether it was energy, whether it was other commodities, or whether it was even manufacturing, and so on in the case of Asia. But that appears to have come to an end. At the end of the Great Recession, what we've seen is an end of what we could call globalization, this great expansion of global trade to GDP and capital flows. So that the share of global trade in GDP has actually been falling uh, since the Great Recession. And so that is squeezing the ability of uh, all economies the advanced capitalist economies, but also the poorer ones uh, to expand their economies on the basis of a widening of trade. And the other big phenomenon which has taken place in the 21st century is the move away from the share in world trade for the G7 economies, which you can see back in the 1990s had about 45% of world GDP, and the rise in the share of the bigger so-called emerging economies, which have the this brand title of BRICS, which means Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And now, as we see, maybe some more to join that particular grouping and branding. But back in the 1990s, they had about 18% of GDP compared to the G7, with much smaller population having 45% of the GDP. But we can see that at the point of the pandemic slump, there was a crossover. So now the BRICS total has risen to about 35%, and the G7 total has fallen to 28%. So there's a relative shift in the contribution to world GDP between these two particular groups. What does that mean? Does this mean we're entering a multipolar world? This is a big discussion going on, that the United States will not maintain its hegemonic position, its allies in the G7, if you like to call it, the imperialist bloc in the world, will not maintain its position with the rise of the emerging economy, particularly the BRICS. Well, I'd like to caution to this and remember that it's, you cannot rely on this bringing about a dramatic change in the hegemonic position of the United States. The left-hand graph shows the international role of the US dollar as it is now. Its world trade position has dropped considerably. Its global GDP position for the US is around 20%. But if you look at its position financially, it is still controlling most of the financial and capital flows in the world. The dollar is still the dominant uh, currency in the world economy. And because of that, it's in a position to control much of the financial and capital flows around the world. And the BRICS nations may be have taken a bigger share of world GDP. But when you look at it and strip out the population which exists in those countries, and we look at the growth in output per person, in the BRICS 
economies, then we can see they're still well behind the G7. Uh, we can see that the United States has a per capita GDP of around $80,000. This is in the uh, purchasing power parity. I won't go into what that means, but basically it's a way of trying to measure all these in the same way. Uh, and the lowest one, Japan is at $50,000. The highest of the BRICS is Russia at just over $30,000. And China, the huge Chinese economies per person's uh, output is only just about over 20,000. And when we get down to India, the next biggest population in the world in part of BRICS, it is really just under $10,000. So the, the BRICS economies are still very much weaker in productive power compared to the uh, imperialist G7 economies. And if you look at what's happening within the BRICS economies, we can see that there is a very interesting development. There is only one country which is really catching up. This is the relationship between the BRICS to the G7 per capita GDP. Only one country is catching up with the, with the G7, and that is China. It has gone from virtually nothing in the 1990s, about 3%, the same as India, to around 26, 27% now of per capita GDP ratio to the G7. But if we look at the other BRICS economies, take the uh, uh, South Africa, which used to be closest uh, back in the 1980s to the G7, it is slowly and gradually deteriorating and has lost, it has fought the gap, is widening between South Africa and the rich countries. If we look at Brazil, which appears to make a big jump during the commodity boom uh, up until the Great Recession, it too is declining back. And it's fallen behind China now uh, in that ratio to the G7 economies. And if we look at India, which is supposedly going to replace China as the great new power economically, uh, because China is in trouble, so the Western media says, we can see that India is getting nowhere, really, in, the, in catching up with the US. It still remains under or around about 5% uh, in the ratio to the G7 per capita economies. So within BRICS, it's only China that is really transforming the picture. And that is why, of course, we're seeing the growing battle between the United States, the G7, and dealing with China's growth, economic power, manufacturing prowess, and trading position around the world. Just want to add a couple of other points about things that lie behind the growth in the world economy is stagnation, the difficulties that exist between the poor and rich countries. That's the extreme inequality that continues to exist around the world. It is truly staggering. This is a figure from a global wealth report uh, produced by Credit Suisse and UBS. And you, they've built a little pyramid here. And you can see up the top, fifth, just under 59 million people, or 1% of the world's population, own 44% of all the personal wealth in the world. That's personal wealth after debt that people have in terms of their homes, in terms of their savings, in terms of any stocks they might have. That's higher than it was in the pandemic. And if we look at the bottom here, we can see that 2.8 billion people, 2.8 billion people, which is more than about 40% or 52% of the world's population, adult population, because we're only talking about the adults here, had just 1.2% of world wealth, personal wealth. So they've got nothing at all. So um, if you're sitting in a room with friends and you're asking yourself, where do you fit in this pyramid? If you've got any sort of savings and if you've got any sort of home, which you at least partially own, if you've got those things, you're not even in this section. You're probably not even in the gray, se gray section. You're probably in this dark section here, the top 12%. Can you believe that? And you probably think you're pretty poor. Uh, but because so many people have absolutely nothing, that you can be further up the pyramid than you think. That's the situation on a world scale. I had a quick look at inequality in Iran, just for your benefit. It's quite interesting to see. If we look at income, that's in inequality of incomes first. Uh, the top 1% in 1980 had 22.9% of all personal income in Iran. That's actually, their share has actually fallen a little to 18%. Top 10% have also seen a fall from 57 to 52%. And the bottom 50% have seen a slight rise from 11 to 13%. So over the period of the Iranian revolution, if you want to call it, 
there's actually been a slight reduction in the inequality, but it's still huge uh, in terms of income. And wealth is always much higher. What people own and salt away or have is always much higher in, in inequality terms than it is income. 1980s, top 1% had 32% uh, when the Shah went, if you like, uh, of uh, personal wealth in Iran. That's now 28%, uh, a little lower. The top 10% had nearly 70% of all personal wealth, now at 62. And the bottom 50% have seen a slight improvement in their share. Of course, the overall wealth increase has been limited, so that increase in share doesn't mean a lot when you're absolute figures don't rise very much. But it's interesting to see uh, that Iran is a very unequal country. It's not by any means the most unequal country in the world, though, when you'd be surprised to know the United States has worse figures than this. Of course, every individual in the United States on the whole is better off, but has worse inequality than this. And countries like in the BRICS, like Brazil and South Africa, have even worse figures. Uh, than Iran. But everywhere in the world, inequality is huge. Uh, just another point we have to remind ourselves as we go into 2024, that the planet is burning up. Last year was the hottest year on record for the world. And the 2024 looks like beating that, we shall see. The world is melting. The world is burning up. And yet nothing is really being done to solve this problem sufficiently when millions, possibly hundreds of millions of people are facing conditions over the next decade that will make their lives uninhabitable and will be forced to move. I mention that because we often forget when we're just looking at the economies, we mustn't remember the huge environmental damage that is going on around the world, in Iran and elsewhere as well. But the big issue perhaps before us, as I mentioned before, is the growing uh, struggle on trade, manufacturing and other matters, military too, uh, between the US and China in particular, and of course, between US and its allies and Russia now with the proxy wars in Ukraine and Gaza. Apart from those two wars, Israel and Gaza, Russia and Ukraine, the world, this battle is still a cold war. It's a battle over try, trying to control Chinese exports, uh, trying to reduce the ability of China to improve its technology, to isolate it and strangle it. But it may not just stop at a Cold War as we go forward. I'm reminded of the period during the Long Depression of the late 19th century, uh, a similar period to what we have now. Frederick Engels forecast an arms race amongst the leading industrial powers that could eventually lead to, I quote, a world war, a world war moreover of extent and violence hitherto unimagined. Eight to 10 million soldiers at each other's throats and in the process, they will strip Europe Fairer than a swarm of locusts. That was in 1887. And as we know, within a couple of decades, we had the first what we call world war in the 20th century. This is the danger. This is the danger we have to remember when we're looking at the economics of the world, but the political consequences could be disastrous. Already we have a war warming up in Europe. Uh, Europe is planning to build a, a NATO line across uh, uh, the borders with Russia and Belarus, uh, and Russia is similarly trying to build its defences along that border. So we have a position where the dangers of uh, conflict are increasingly rising, not just in Ukraine, but actually between uh, Europe and Russia and its proxies. And the growing tensions over Taiwan. That's going to be the major issue, politically and politically, in, in the rest of this decade. So the economic crises and the difficulties that the world economy is facing, the US economy's relative decline in the world, and its de determination to maintain its hegemonic position means taking on China and where China is at the moment, particularly over the question of Taiwan, which they can use as a thorn in the side of the Chinese government. And that issue is not resolved and could end in a serious uh, tensions that, that should lead to military conflict. These are the dangers ahead. So when we're looking at the economic crises or the difficulties that the world economy has, the world capitalist economy, we cannot divide that from the dangers that will lead to geopolitical conf conflict of major proportions. And that, Yasamin, is my little piece. <laughs>
Thank you very much. I, these were very useful, especially the information about Iran. So if it's possible, I want to ask a couple of questions. Your data on Iran shows in some ways that the period where the nuclear deal was possible uh, and the very short time where, between the nuclear deal and uh, Trump walking out of the deal were the, if you like, the best of the last 10 years. Um, am I, I want you to expand on this if possible. Do you agree with this? I didn't, um, I didn't see things wrong. I, uh, your graph in terms of gross uh, GDP uh, per uh, capita for yeah. Iran, 2014, 2015, which were the times when discussions were taking place. Right. And then um, the actual deal. Um, show a level of growth. Uh, significant because the debates in the Iranian election uh, right now, presidential election, where we have two people facing each other, are concentrating on this issue in that um, the more hardline candidate, Jalili, is saying, um, we don't need a nuclear deal. We don't, we can carry on. And yet, both the rate of inflation, which went very high in 2023, and growth seem to imply that situations got worse when there was no sign of a deal. Am I right in this assumption? Well, I think what's the interesting thing about the three graphs I've got on Iran, uh, that the investment to graph, which um, we can put up again later if you want to, but it shows that in the period you're talking about, when there was a possibility of a deal over the nuclear uh, and therefore the end of sanctions uh, during the period, I think you said between sort of 2015, 2016, is that correct? Um, um, we can see that there was a rise in the investment sure. uh, in Iran uh, domestically quite sharply uh, by a considerable amount from 2016 to 2018. But with the you could argue with the collapse of the possibility of a nuclear deal, the reinforcement of the sanctions and the strangling of the, the attempt to strangle the Iranian economy by the West, we can see a sharp drop in investment after that period right down into the uh, COVID pandemic of 2020 and hasn't really recovered from that. So Iran is uh, being squeezed by the world economy slowing down. So the ability of selling uh, oil, energy and any other resources that Iran has got abroad has been reduced. It's being still strangled by sanctions, which make it difficult to invest in new technology and in boosting employment and so on. So the economy is stagnating. Uh, the GDP per person has been stagnating for a long time, and it really hasn't been able to revive because of the sanctions and because of the world economy not growing really since 2008 in any effective way. And as you say, what we've seen, uh, the inflation boost obviously comes about even uh, before uh, the COVID pandemic uh, recovery, which where most other countries have suffered an inflation rise uh, from 2021 to 2023, while uh, Iran suffered that as well. But it even had an inflation rise earlier than that because of the squeeze in the world economy, which was beginning in the end of 2019 and through into 2020. So... Iran is suffering because it's a small capitalist economy which needs to trade, it needs to use its resources, it needs uh, investment, including foreign investment, in order to modernize its economy and make it effective with a, and to bring employment to the mass of population which exists in Iran, with many of whom are very skilled workers but can't use their skills. And it's unable to do, though, do that because of the combination of economic sanctions if you like, the failure of a nuclear deal that would relieve that and the world economy's really slowing down growth rate. I'll just say to viewers that even with a nuclear deal and the, perhaps the ending of its sanctions, which perhaps would open up the economy to foreign investment, there is still no guarantee uh, that you would see a dramatic improvement in growth rates when the world economy is slowing down and when it means perhaps that foreign companies will be controlling 
uh, the gains that might be made in Iran. One um, other question: You did a, you gave a very good comparison of the United States as the hegemon capitalist country, and compared it with BRICS. And um, obviously, even though I hadn't seen the graphs, I could not. I had thought that China was very different from the others. But in t in terms of becoming hegemon power. Um, because this is being debated again very much in Iran, that uh, the US is in decline, we don't need to worry about the US, we can make deals with China. Uh, or we can rely on China and maybe Russia to save our economy. The problem I have with this argument is that decline can take a very long time. And, uh, before a new hegemon power emerges, there has we are, we can't predict it and it can take many years, many decades. But also that in some ways to become a hegemon power, China will need um, a better position globally in terms of the currency, where the dollar is no longer the dominant currency, but also in terms of politics and military situation. Uh, more nuclear arsenal, maybe a better air force, a more powerful air force, I'm not sure. But hegemon powers aren't just decided in terms of economy. Uh, am I right in proposing these or am I just supposing these on the basis of previous um, hegemons coming to power? Well, I think there are several things here uh, that viewers should think about. First of all, it's true that um, the US economy is in relative decline. It's been in relative, de relative decline for the last 40 years. And we saw that by the changes in the share of GDP between the emerging, big emerging economies and the G7. That includes uh, the US. But it's only a relative decline. They're still the most, la the largest capitalist economy in the world. Uh, they still have the highest per capita GDP in the world of, of a large economy. If we exclude Switzerland and Norway or Luxembourg and these rather smaller economies are uh, special cases. This is the most powerful economic country in the world. It has the dollar as the main international currency, which is still the main international currency by a long way. Uh, most transactions are still in the dollar. Yes, it's changing a little bit. So we're seeing that transactions say between Iran, China and Russia could be in the, in the yuan or in the ruble, uh, maybe. Uh, to some extent that's uh, taking place, but it's still very limited. I looked at the data only recently and we're still talking a very tiny proportion of financial and trade transactions. Yes, that will probably increase, but it's not going to be going towards this an argument that somehow the dollar is going to be replaced with some sort of BRICS currency or uh, the Chinese yuan, as you say, which has about 3% of world transactions, is nothing. Uh, and why does it only have small one? Well, apart from the fact that China is still a, a much smaller per capita economy financially as well, it's because China doesn't allow the free flow of one around the world. It wants to protect its economy through capital controls, quite rightly, in my view. If it was to open the doors, uh, and let currencies be speculated on, its currency speculated on by Western financial powers around the world, it will be opening itself up to serious financial crisis. That's why it doesn't do it. But the price for that is it cannot expand itself as an international currency. So the idea, and I think this perhaps this is the basis point that viewers should point out, uh, should think about, is that the idea that the BRICS, even as a unit, or China, is going to replace the US in a international power struggle over the next decade or so, even if it expands in different areas sufficiently, is not going to happen. We are facing a position where at least for a decade uh, and maybe longer, the US will be attempting to crush China's growth and it has a lot of power to do so. And if necessary, it would appear there are elements in the US that are prepared to use military uh, conflict to do so. So we're entering a much more serious period. What is the way to defeat the hegemonic power and US imperialism? In my view, it's not to expect 
the likes of Putin, Modi, Xi, Ramaphosa in South Africa, Brazil's Lula, in some way to become great imperialist, anti-imperialist leaders. These people in many places are suppressing their own populations and preserving the position of the inequalities that we see in Iran as well. The idea that the mullahs of Iran or some sort of reformist leadership in Iran is going to become a major anti-imperialist force against the US, I think is an illusion, which Iranian viewers should be well aware uh, uh, be warned against. The only way we're going to defeat imperialism and the US is through struggle by the labor movements in our own countries and also in the G7 countries as well. It means a class struggle within those countries. That is the way things would change. And that is what we must, we mustn't allow the idea, yes, okay, the BRICs are improving their position. Yes, the US is a bit weaker, but if you think that's going to be the way that will change the world, then I think you, you're making a big mistake and it would be a big diversion from the class struggle that we must be engaged in. That's very useful, thank you. One last question, because I, I don't want to take all the time of this question. Um, and maybe this is a difficult one to reply, but um, Iran has entered as part of the um, Belt and Road um, project of China, Iran has signed during the ex-president Raisi's time a 25-year deal with China. My understand it hasn't started. It's still very much on paper or even we could say virtual. It's not even on paper, it's in program. Uh, when I read some uh, details of that deal. It was very clear that China had made a number of major projects, which include petrochemical, port construction, some of, you know, huge projects. Many of these conditional on the ending of sanc Western sanctions. Mm -hmm. And my uh, analysis of the, my understanding of this was that China has paid heavily or Chinese banks have paid heavily uh, for fines imposed by US and the West on accusations, I assume they are true, but accus at this stage, I don't know, accusations that they were involved in sanctions busting. And I wondered if you could say a bit about the Belt and Road uh, projects in general. Uh, it is true that, on paper at least, the deals are less um, imperialist or less punitive for the countries that are signing them. Iran is not the only country. Saudi Arabia is involved in a major project with China now, which might explain their slight independence when it comes to some of US's policies. But in terms of sanctions and so on, would you, am I right in saying that Chinese banks and the Chinese economy is very protective of their own future when it comes to the West? Because they don't want to risk things. Iran is a small, if you like, is a small uh, player in all this and it's not worth the risk. Or are they more, uh, more adventurous when it comes to such projects? Well, China's Belt and Road Initiative was a major development. Um, it's not, I don't know how long it's been going now, maybe 10, 15 years. And that uh, I think the Chinese plan was that they wanted to develop their connections and gain resources from countries around the world in return for which they would come in and build huge infrastructure projects, which they had the skills and the manpower and the technology to do so. And they would fund this basically through the banks, but we're talking about the state banks. So basically this is state investment coming in. Yes, there were commercial terms, but they weren't unreasonable. They were generally reasonable terms. And in many cases, as you say, the Chinese state banks have lost money in doing this. But nevertheless, the Chinese government saw this as an important development to build their 
a network of support around the world, but also to raise the development of some of the poorer countries uh, around the world as a result. Um, and it's in many ways, it's there have been things that have gone wrong, but on the whole, it's been a big success. The Western capitalist powers of, and their uh, private investment plans through the IMF, World Bank and so on, have been totally useless compared to what uh, China has done, particularly for the uh, so-called global south. So uh, in that sense, it, it's a good development. But um, it's there are still a, a number of issues with this. Firstly, let me dispense with the view that in some way China has driven all these countries into a debt trap. That's the argument the Western media puts forward, that now uh, countries like Iran will be in hock and countries in Africa are in hock to China forever, a huge amounts of debt, which uh, the Chinese will use to blackmail these countries and so on. This is nonsense. If anything, the IMF terms are way, way worse uh, than the Chinese terms are. Uh, and that is why China doesn't make much money <laughs> out of these projects, really. They see them as, as developing their political influence and so on. Uh, so it's an early stage for a 25 year project. The idea that it would only take place if Western sanctions are removed is an indication, I think, that the Chinese government is in, in a fix. They're in two minds about which way to go, as you correctly point out. They want to develop these projects to build connections and linkages with uh, important countries in the so-called global south that will be in opposition to the US and provide a bulwark of support. On the other hand, they're not ready to fall out with the US. They don't want to fall out with the US. They're still doing their very best to avoid confrontation with the US, uh, to ignore provocations in Taiwan, to find ways in which they can expand their uh, industry and trade in Europe and other places without all the sanctions that are being applied to them. But of course, they're facing an in, an in, irresistible and irrepressible and never-ending effort now on the part of the US and its allies to reduce China's influence. So the pressure is on them all the time and they're not going to, they're trying to avoid coming to the point where they have to make uh, a move one way or the other, but they're forced on every occasion. So it'd be interesting to see whether this 25-year project ever gets off the ground because I'm not sure that Western sanctions in Iran are going to be removed anytime soon. So this project may sit there unless China changes its idea and is forced into operating these projects against the interests of trying to have some sort of coexistence with, with the United States. I don't know which way this is going to go, I have to say. Thank you very much. This has been a really very useful for me. I've learned so much, so thanks a lot. Let me, let me just say, uh, it's been, I've got the, the slides, so I'll, if I like, I could just, if you give me a moment, I'll put them up. Do you want me to okay. send them to you? or do we? I like think them? it's easier if you send them, then we will put them on the side of the Good. talk. Yep. That yep. would be very useful. And as I said, we will uh, carry on with uh, other questions, but this was very useful, and thanks very much for your time. Great, it's been good to do that. Thanks. I'll stop there again.